We all begin anew today. What a great day. May the, may the eternal spirit of all life be with us and within us and renew each of us as we gather here. For parents now begin to know their children as adults. Former high school students and transfer students begin to become scholars in this community of scholars. Professors re-envision what they teach and the research they pursue in dialogue with fresh thinkers. The California sun enlivens all of us. The colors are bright and our dreams are too. To begin anew is exhilarating and unnerving. It's hopeful and tearful. It's full of promises and it's overwhelming. May each of us understand though that a unique community is beginning right here and now in this moment. The Stanford class of 2014. Stanford will be changed by this class, as well as by the transfer students who have arrived today. May this be a beloved community that will help embrace and support and uphold each of us. May the process of education here ground us deeply, grant us courage, and free us from repeating the mistakes of the past, personal and collective. May we develop enough wisdom here that the things that matter the most are not 
at the mercy of the things that matter the least. May we learn to be true to ourselves so that we cannot be false to anyone. We ask for the blessings of God in the language of some. We ask for knowledge of the beauty of truth and of the truth of beauty in the language of others. And finally, we ask this, may the understanding which each of us develops here in this great center of learning play its part in transforming a needy world into a global community of peace and justice. Amen. And now I'm pleased to introduce a person whom I imagine each of you feel very good about, the Dean of Admission and Financial Aid, Richard Shaw. President Hennessy, deans, faculty, administrators, trustees, and members of the Stanford community, today at our great university's 120th convocation, we celebrate the magnificent class of 2014. Men and women of the incoming class, we welcome you, we salute you, and now I command you to engage in a thunderous cheer. <laughs> Convocation is my favorite event at Stanford. It brings together in this historic quadrangle an extraordinary group of students. All of you have worked hard to arrive at this place. All of you have long anticipated this moment. Each of you in your own unique way will bring something exceptional to Stanford. To those of us who read your applications, your potential and promise are breathtaking. Let me tell you more about who you are as a class. 1,675 of you incoming freshmen, 20 of you are transfer students joining the academic community at Stanford. Collectively, you represent 1,908 secondary schools uh, in 49 states and 54 countries. Oh my gosh, South Dakota. <laughs> More than 8% of you are international students, 48% of you are women, and 52% men. 15% of you will be the first in your family to attend college. And close to 50% of you are receiving financial support from Stanford for your undergraduate education. You are artists and musicians, scientists and journalists, actors and editors, researchers and writers, athletes and former soldiers. You are Intel finalists, Olympiad winners, published authors and top debaters, among hundreds of other talents and accomplishments. You have been recognized at the highest level. My staff and I spent approximately 11,000 hours reviewing 33,275 applications to arrive at this outstanding new student body here today. Your teachers and counselors testified to your talent, ability, and motivation. You told us in your own words of your passion and intention to contribute in significant ways. We see your academic motivation and your personal experiences reflecting a world of possibilities as your lives unfold at Stanford and beyond. At this point, some of you may be asking yourselves, is he really talking about me? Some of you might be secretly wondering if, uh, if you were the one mistake that the admissions office made this year. <laughs> Let me be emphatic. We have not made any mistakes in selecting this superlative class. A good and wise friend sees more in you than you see in yourself. This is what we do. This is our profession. This is our work, to identify in you the intellectual strength and leadership 
potential to impact the world, to see in you the promise of the future. We have chosen you, and we have not made a single mistake. A convocation, in the simplest of terms, is a coming together. The convocation ceremony also marks a transition. You are leaving the familiarity of home and high school and embracing a new independence. Soon you will be say goodbye to family members, and in quiet moments you will realize the awesome responsibility of deciding next steps for yourself. While at Stanford, take on those next steps with an open heart and open mind. Engage in discovery and know that no truth is so absolute it cannot be challenged. Compete on the playing fields like a champion. Seek out those who may seem different from you. This is your time of exploration. It will afford you the greatest freedom of your life. Before I conclude, I want you to look around Breathe deeply and savor this moment. Appreciate the beauty of this quadrangle. Soak up the California sunshine and take in your new classmates. They are your companions for the journey that awaits you. Many will become your friends for life. Students of the class of 2014, I now officially deliver you to Stanford's three undergraduate schools and introduce you to the, to the Freeman Thornton Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and Professor in the Humanities, Harry J. Elam, Jr. Thank you, Dean Shaw, for your remarks and for bringing to Stanford this amazing new class. As Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, and on behalf of all of the Stanford faculty, I accept and welcome you, the transfer students and freshman class of 2014, to Stanford University. Marked by this ceremony of convocation, and by your matriculation at Stanford, I also call on you to recognize your new membership in an old and enduring fellowship, the Fellowship of the Mind. This fellowship is one sustained by belief in the inestimable value of learning, by the infinite power of knowledge. It is a fellowship nurtured not simply by the countless hours spent note-taking in the classroom, toiling in the lab, practicing in the music studio, rehearsing in the theater, or studying in the dorm. Rather, the fellowship of which I speak is created by the intellectual excitement, spontaneous community, the pleasurable exhaustion that comes with the realization that you are actually helping to create knowledge. Even as you may work independently, you will be part of a larger community devoted to contemplation as well as to action knowing that you join a collection of fellow travelers knee-deep in deep thinking. You are not alone. You are one with us. From day one on this campus, as freshmen and transfer students, you are a full member of this fellowship. The Stanford faculty recognizes that every entering student, each and every single one of you, are capable of great things and we are here to help you realize this greatness. And consequently, your education here will never just be a process of simply receiving knowledge from your professors, but of engaging in a continually evolving partnership with them and with your peers. It will be a partnership that encourages questioning, probing, investigation, one that thrives on the process of give and take, which is so critical to the production of knowledge. Here at Stanford, you will be presented with marvelous opportunities. You will face significant intellectual challenges, some, I might add, of your own exhilarating design. You will be able to explore academically in new and potentially groundbreaking ways. These are some of the elements that constitute the fellowship of the mind here at Stanford, and they represent part of our covenant with you. 
For as Dean Shaw said, from the myriad of applications that came Stanford's way, we selected you. Ah, but you selected us as well. You had other options, other suitors at your doors, but you chose Stanford. We know this, and you have our pledge to partner with you in your process of becoming, for you also help us to grow and change. But what of your end of this pact? What do we expect of you? Our expectation is at once simple and complex. We ask that you avoid the cliché. When someone seeks to define or delimit what constitutes a Stanford student, step outside of those limitations. What this means in engaging in Stanford from today forward with openness, with creativity, with inventiveness of spirit. We ask that you remain open to new possibilities, except the unexpected accidents of discovery that may result from an unexpected experiment gone awry. Of course, we want you to work to your fullest, to give your whole self over to the academic enterprise. But we know that this may mean taking on decidedly new approaches to subject matter. It may require knowledge and accepting difference. And it also may require the inevitability of change. I remember well my mother and father taking me off to my first days of college so many years ago. My parents hated my dorm room. Too small and old, my mother thought. Your dorms, here, your dorms here at Stanford are so much better, believe me. My mom, with tears in her eyes, pulled me aside and asked me to do one thing for her, simply to savor my college days to devour them like I used to do her prime roast beef. While she did not like my room, she loved that I was entering new physical and intellectual spaces. Even as she admitted she would miss my presence at home, she celebrated my opportunity to learn and grow on my own. I think she understood, as your parents sitting beside you do now, that this is your moment. So embrace it, enjoy it, Relish it, make it your own, and do not be afraid to be, let it remake you as well. In his 1903 classic, The Souls of Black Folk, the great intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois writes, quote, the true college will ever have one goal, not to earn meat, but to know the end and aim of that life which meat nourishes. Du Bois's comments at the turn of the last century still have resonance in this new millennium. For him, college education is not just about the pursuit of a vacation. It is not just a means to material end. It is not just about the meat. That is not just about getting by. Rather, Du Bois asked of college education higher goals and aspirations, specifically that you know the end and aim of that life which meat nourishes. Such deep knowing is not and cannot ever be easy. But it is this understanding that makes one a full participant in the life of a nation and of the world. This is the mission that now awaits you here at Stanford as you enter into our fellowship, our covenant with you, and as you begin your search for the end and aim of life. And we are so very glad that you are here. And we look forward to guiding, counseling, supporting you on this journey, a journey which yokes us profoundly together from this day onward. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the student speaker, Senior Zev Carlin Newman. Thank you, Vice Provost Elam, for those wonderfully warm and welcoming words, which I, in some ways, will echo. Members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty, families, freshmen, transfers, good afternoon. 
It's a pleasure to sit, share this exciting day with you all, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. As I was thinking about what I wanted to say here, I came across a quote in a student's letter to a friend that nicely encapsulated my thoughts. Have become very fond of Stanford, this student wrote. Everyone is very friendly, the gals are quite attractive, and it's a very good life. I could have written these words myself freshman year, but they were in fact penned in 1940 by a young John F. Kennedy. I can still recall the flash of excitement I felt when I discovered that little known fact that JFK walked these sandstone and tile corridors for a few brief months while auditing business school classes. <laughs> I had recently returned from a quarter studying and interning with the Bing, Stanford, and Washington program, and I hungered for a link to that world of politics and public service. I identified with JFK's youthful uncertainty. If he could transform himself from an aimless student into a visionary leader, could Stanford similarly reveal and focus my potential? I threw myself into research, intending to write an honors thesis about Stanford's influence on JFK. So you can imagine the disappointment when I opened up the papers of a Stanford professor who supposedly knew JFK here and discovered that he could not recall meeting him. <laughs> With only a few old newspaper articles and interviews to go on, I had hit a dead end. I couldn't prove that one of our most dynamic and inspirational presidents was indelibly shaped by the innovation, optimism, and egalitarianism of Stanford University. I did learn, however, that I have been. These years have passed in a whirlwind of extracurriculars, social events, and academic excitement. This is the only place where Bill Gates and Afro Man can be on campus simultaneously, or where you'll see more former Latin American presidents than rainy days. Long runs to the dish, and Nerf Wars and Green Library gradually gave way to studying in the Bender Reading Room with late night conversations on politics, religion, and philosophy thrown in over a midnight snack. I have road trip to Nevada for political campaigns in the fall, cheered on Cardinal basketball in the winter, and fountain hopped in the spring. Throughout it all, my incredible professors have encouraged me to think deeply within and across disciplines, to question the world around me, to learn for learning's sake. Every one of these instances has affected in some way the person I am still becoming, the person I sought to find through my exploration of JFK's time here. Stanford has provided, to paraphrase the artist and architect Maya Lin, space in which to think, but not what to think. That space is one of engagement and excitement, challenge and triumph, friendship and discovery. In that same box of papers, for instance, I discovered a promising new thesis idea linking JFK and the Senate where I interned. This idea would ultimately enable me to work with Pulitzer Prize winning historian David Kennedy, no relation to JFK. It would put me in touch with the personal hero, JFK speechwriter Ted Sorensen. It would let me read and write and rewrite, experiencing new cities and romantic, dusty archives along the way. In fact, I've only just returned from a thesis research trip to Boston and DC last week and leave for another one tomorrow morning. So, I didn't find a president, but I found and developed my passions. I found thoughtful, creative, brilliant people 
to share this journey with, I discovered that I didn't need to prove how meaningful Stanford was to one particular person I admired, because I realized how much my years here have meant to me, just as you all will discover what they will mean to you. Exactly 50 years ago, JFK returned to deliver the 1960 Convocation Address at this very ceremony. Though perhaps little impacted by Stanford, by then he was a war hero, an experienced congressman and senator, recently declared for the presidency. That is likely not my path, but it may be yours. Or maybe you will bring needed integrity to the business world, develop a revolutionary alternative energy source, create an NGO. Maybe you will enter the world of professional sports or academia, netting a free throw or a Nobel Prize. You may even become the next generation of scholars and teachers who shape our paths here. Because whether or not I can prove that Stanford influenced JFK, I do know that Stanford will have a profound and transformative impact on all of our lives. So open those dusty boxes in the archives, risk disappointment and failure, question your preconceived notions. Lean on friends and family, develop your passion, engage in your surroundings, find and make meaning in your time here. Above all, love to learn and learn to love. Ladies and gentlemen of the class of 2014, welcome to Stanford. Everyone is very friendly, the gals are quite attractive, and it's a very good life. Thank you. It is now my honor to introduce the president of Stanford University, John Hennessy. Thank you, Zeb, for that wonderful message and for the insights about JFK's education. Harvard was claiming him, but now we are, so. <laughs> Parents, transfer students, and members of the class of 2014, good afternoon. Welcome to the 120th Convocation Exercises. Welcome to Stanford. Each fall, as I prepare for convocation and the arrival of a new class of Stanford students, I contemplate the message I want to deliver and look for inspiration, often among my recent reading. This past spring, I saw the movie Invictus, which, if you haven't seen it, is absolutely worthwhile. It tells the story of Nelson Mandela's early days as the first democratically elected South African president and his support for the South African rugby team, which overcame incredible odds to win the World Cup in 1995 and unite the country. The movie inspired me to read Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. In his book, Mandela writes about realizing the importance of education in liberating his people and the tremendous negative impact they suffered from not having equal access to education. He writes, education is the great engine of development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become head of the mine, and that the child of farm workers can become the president of a great nation. You, our newest students will have access to the resources of a great university and to its teachers and distinguished scholars. It is an opportunity and a responsibility. I urge you to use this opportunity to the maximum. As our Vice Provost Harry Elam said, it is a unique opportunity granted only to a few. 
My first piece of advice is to get to know the faculty. Our faculty have a passion for learning and a desire to share their knowledge with others. Alumni have told us that getting to know a faculty member personally was one of the most rewarding aspects of their Stanford experience. And this university has invested heavily over the past 15 years to create many more such opportunities. A hallmark of our innovations in undergraduate education has been the freshman seminar program. Each of our seminars is led by a Stanford faculty member and enrolls no more than 16 students. This year, there will be freshman seminars on an incredibly wide range of topics, from biotechnology to the welfare system, from Mozart's operas to horse medicine. These classes are a unique and wonderful opportunity to get to know a faculty member and a new subject. But get to know the faculty outside of the classroom as well. Use the opportunity to discover why they are passionate about their scholarly pursuits. While I love giving an exciting lecture to a packed classroom, my greatest enjoyment comes when a student comes to visit my office to talk about research, to ask career advice, or to seek help on a difficult topic. And these relationships often continue long after graduation. Just this weekend, I received an email from a former undergraduate advisee of mine who will be returning this fall for her fifth reunion. She simply asked, could we get together to talk about my career and the possibility of me returning to school for my PhD? I said, absolutely. Over the next few years, you'll also get to know many fellow students students with different backgrounds, cultures, and beliefs. You may find that your own values and your beliefs are challenged. I hope that you will discover a new understanding and appreciation of our pluralistic society and develop your skills in interacting with people quite different from you. As Mandela is advising some of his fellow activists in prison, he comes to know a number of white jail keepers reasonably well. And the jail keepers become sympathetic to the cause and see the injustice perpetrated by both apartheid and the imprisonment of the activists. Mandela writes, this is precisely why the National Party was violently opposed to all forms of integration. Only a white electorate indoctrinated with the idea of a black threat, ignorant of African ideas and policies, could support the monstrous racist philosophy of the Nationalist Party. Familiarity in this case, he says, would not breed contempt, but understanding, and even eventually harmony. Throughout his autobiography, Mandela remains committed to the service of his community, and through that service, he comes to many new insights. I encourage you to consider the opportunity to learn through service as one vehicle for broadening your experience. Stanford's Haas Center is one of the oldest centers for public service in any university. It offers hundreds of opportunities for you to learn and contribute to the local community as well as internationally. These days, we often talk about the need to prepare students to be members of a global community and to ready themselves to live in a world that is increasingly interconnected. When Mandela was a boy and attending school, he was taught the superiority of Russian ideas, of British ideas, British culture, and British institutions his perspective both on the world and his own culture suffered. Now, 80 years later, the internet has vastly increased global interaction as well as our knowledge of societies around the world. Isolation is not possible for any nation, physically, economically, environmentally, or intellectually. Stanford has been a leader in overseas studies for more than 40 years and incorporating an overseas studies experience in your education 
will help prepare you to be a better global citizen. Mandela was ambitious for change in South Africa, and he saw his long walk to freedom as a lifelong effort for which he focused on preparing himself, not only as a young man, but also during his 26 years of imprisonment. The four years that most of you will stay here will go quickly, and I urge you to make the most of this time. You have chosen to attend a university that is not only a great educational institution, but also a great research institution. At Stanford, you can take courses and attend seminars that explore the frontiers of fields where new knowledge and understanding are being created, and you can contribute to that process. For me, participating in undergraduate research led me from my undergraduate major in electrical engineering to my graduate work in computer science. And it ignited a passion for being on the leading edge of discovery, being at the forefront of discovery and taking part in the creation of new knowledge is an immensely rewarding and life-altering experience. Of course, real growth involves not only risking failure, but also overcoming adversity. In launching his freedom campaign, Mandela was aware of the incredible risks he faced. And when he was arrested, he was challenged to find ways to remain committed to the freedom struggle during his many years in prison. You will certainly face intellectual challenges during your time here at Stanford, but I encourage you to experiment and take intellectual risks. Challenge yourself with courses in disciplines that are new to you, and should you occasionally not succeed, do not become disillusioned. The only people I know who succeed at everything they undertake are those who have been timid in setting their goals. A cornerstone of Mandela's efforts to bring about a democratic South Africa was to develop a set of ideals inspired largely by our Declaration of Independence. The Freedom Charter, which he helped draft, opens with the following words. We, the people of South Africa, declare for all our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. Today, you join a university community created and bound by a commitment to similar lofty ideals, a community of scholars dedicated to the pursuit of truth, knowledge, and understanding. It is a community rooted in principles established by the university's founders and early leaders, by Jane and Leland Stanford, who after the tragic death of their son at the age of 15, founded this university to benefit other people's children. And as it says in the founding grant, to exercise an influence on behalf of humanity and civilization. By Stanford's first president, David Starr Jordan, who chose the university's motto, the wind of freedom blows, to remind us of the importance and privilege of free and open inquiry and by Stanford's first faculty and students, who in 1896 created the fundamental standard which emphasizes personal integrity and respect for each and every member of the scholarly community. This standard is still in effect more than 100 years later. As you begin your time at Stanford and plan your years here, I urge you to remember that your undergraduate education is much more than a ticket to your first job. Mandela's law studies prepared him for a life of work with his fellow activists, helping to educate them and prepare them for their many struggles. 
His education also prepared him to be an effective advocate for change when he was eventually released from prison. Likewise, your undergraduate education is an opportunity, an opportunity to develop the skills and passion for being a lifelong learner in areas related to and outside of your future career. It is the foundation not just for your first job, but for your entire life. To the parents in the audience, I assure you that Stanford will provide your children a variety of possibilities for growing and learning during the next few years. But it is your children, as individuals, who will choose what excites them, what generates intellectual passion, and what engages their very able minds. I hope that you will support their choices. In the movie Invictus, Mandela aims to motivate the captain of the Springboks with the poem Invictus, which helped inspire Mandela himself during his long imprisonment. The final stanza of that poem is, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So it is with your time here at Stanford. You will have many opportunities, but you are the master of your fate during the next four years. And you will also be responsible for how you use your education after you leave Stanford. But we'll return to that topic at your graduation on June 15th, 2014. <laughs> I welcome all our new students and their parents to the Stanford family, a family that consists not only of the 25,000 students, staff, and faculty on this campus, but also of more than 100,000 alumni around the world. Students, I hope your time here transforms your lives, just as it has transformed the lives of so many alumni. And finally, I hope that your time here will help to provide a foundation on which you will make your contributions to a better future for yourselves and the generations that will follow. Welcome to the farm, welcome to the Stanford community, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I now, with the help of two wonderful students, Susan Lape and Julian Kaznadi, I'm going to introduce you to a famous and important Stanford tradition singing the Stanford hymn. Susan and Julian, won't you come up and help us? Please rise as we sing the alma mater, Hail Stanford Hail. We're going to sing it twice, first on our own, and then we'll ask you to join us. You can find the lyrics in your program. Where the rolling foothills rise up toward mountains higher, where at eve the coast range lies in the sunset fire, flushing deep and paling, here we raise our voices hailing thee, our alma mater, from the foothills to the bay, it shall ring as we sing, it shall ring and float away, hail Stanford, hail, hail Stanford, <laughs> now please join us as we sing it again. 
Where the rolling foothills rise Up toward mountains higher Where at eve the coast range lies In the sunset fire Flushing deep and paling Here we raise our voices hailing thee, our alma mater. From the foothills to the bay, it shall ring as we sing, it shall ring and float away. Hail, Stanford, hail, hail, Stanford, hail. <laughs> Please remain standing for the benediction. Surrounded by arches of stone and the embrace of community, inspired by creativity and conversation, accompanied by seekers of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May this new class in Stanford's rich and robust history, together with those who love and celebrate them, Go forth to an adventure of learning and listening. Go forth to an exploration of community and consequence. Go forth to a cornucopia of gifts and gratitude. Source of wisdom, you who have blessed us with intellectual curiosity, and unbridled opportunity. Grant us as well discerning minds and open hearts that we may use our knowledge for righteous purpose and our promise for creating a world worthy of your trust. May our study be sweet and our learning be lively. Amen. <laughs>